There's a lot going on on this desk. This is an XT compatible computer that I bought and uh, came with this Miniscribe. It's a very common type of stepper motor hard disk. And this one was not working. This is the model 8425XT. It's a very common hard drive. They came in XT IDE, which is this one. It has the 40 pin IDE connector, but it's not really an IDE drive. You cannot connect it into a 286 or 386, 486. You can only use it on an XT computer with the 8 bit IDE interface. Then here on the table, I have another Miniscribe disk. This is the 8425SA, so this is SCSI, and here is the control board for that. But the, the actual hard drive mechanism is the same. The boards are very similar. And what happened here? So this drive was stuck, the spindle was stuck, and the stepper motor was stuck as well. It was not the classic case where the the heads are stuck to the platter. It's just that the old grease was very hard, and uh, the 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 stepper motor wouldn't turn easily. And maybe and that is my theory. And it happened to me a lot of times, where the previous owner of the machine would power it up and try to get the hard drive working for an extended period of time. And maybe he didn't notice that it was stuck. So what happens is that uh, it overloads the, the components on the PCB and it burns them. So when I got the computer home, and usually when I get one of these vintage stepper motor drives with the low density data, like 20 megs, 40 megs, 100 megs, what I do is I take the cover off. You don't actually need a clean room or any sort of stuff for that. Uh, I take the cover off and I try to rotate the platters with very, very gently by the, the center. There's a washer on the center, so I try to turn the platters and see if the, the drive isn't locked. If the drive is locked, you need to sort that out first before you power it up or you will risk damaging the PCB. And that is what happened to this drive. So how did I fix it? Well, I'm not an electronics engineer. I don't have a schematic for this. Uh, I don't even know exactly how it works, but let me show you something. Let's flip the drive over, unplug the cable. Right here, there are two plugs. This one is for this optical sensor here. And this plug right here is for the stepper motor. Now, when I power this drive on, if the drive is good, it will start rotating the stepper in a sequence. It rotates for one side and then to the other, and then it stops in, this, in the middle of this sensor. So the drive is ready to use but this one would just vibrate, it would start vibrating and the disc would not work, okay? Right here there is the connection for an LED and the LED would flash continuously indicating a, an error. So uh, you can look up on a table, there's a table with the, those errors and you can see what they mean but that's pretty much useless because in order for the drive to work, it has to pass the initial power-up sequence. So it starts spinning. The first noise you hear is the spindle picking up speed, and then the stepper motor starts working back and forth, and then it stops. Then the LED should be off, and the drive is ready to use. If it passes that test, chances are the drive will work. Okay, These drives are very re reliable in terms of mechanical mechanical uh, problems they don't 
they just don't go bad very often. The control boards, on the other hand, they are a bit uh, the weak spot, okay? So we would power up this drive and it would just vibrate the stepper back and back and forth very rapidly like the, and it wouldn't, the, the LED would keep on flashing. So like I said, this is the plug for the stepper motor. So the first thing I did was get this drive mechanism. Now this one is a mechanism that still works, but it's very, very worn out. The bearings are shot, it, so it's very noisy. The surface of the bladders is not that great. It has a lot of bad sectors. As you run it, new bad sectors will develop and it's just a, now it's just a parts donor. It's not going to be a reliable drive or anything. So this one is free. Now you should not do this like I did. Okay. Because if the heads are stuck, rotating the platter like this without seeing what's happening, you will rip the heads off. Now you want to take the cover off and do it in the other side while you watch what's happening. If you try to rotate it just a little bit and you see the heads kind of twisting, you want to stop and you want to do it here on the stepper motor. Now another caution you need to take is you don't want to misalign this piece right here with the shaft. If you misalign these two pieces, the drive will stop working and it's going to be a pain in the ass to realign this, okay? I I did it before by trial and error, but it took me hours to figure it out, okay? Like I was saying, I grabbed this drive, I put it here like this side by side, and I plugged the, the plug of the stepper into there. So what I wanted to see is... This drive starting to spin, and then this stepper would try to rotate at least some way or shape or form. Now, I wasn't expecting to expecting it to do the power up sequence perfectly because obviously the stepper is rotating, but the heads are not. But as soon as I plug this motor into this drive, it would still vibrate just like the other one. So. There was obviously a short circuit or some type of damaged component. So, no schematic, I don't know how the drive works. How do we fix this thing? Well, here's the plug for the stepper motor. First thing, I don't know anything about stepper motors or how they operate. So, this is just to show you that anybody can fix anything. So. I started testing components here on the vicinity of the, the plug. Usually components that drive something are near the area where that thing plugs in. This is called uh, potato logic. <laughs> it's not always works, but it, when you use common sense, often you are right. Well, first thing I did was just take a quick test on all the tantalum capacitors and diodes. See if none of the diodes are open or shorted and test if none of these tantalum capacitors are shorted. None of them was shorted. And then there were two integrated circuits right here. And this plug has four connections. Two connections connect to one IC, two connections connect to the other. So these are probably the drivers or something for the stepper, it's for the stepper motor. And here they are, it's a PBL3717. Now I'll explain to you why they are full of solder like this. So I uh, looked up online, PBL3717, according to the data sheet, it says stepper motor driver IC. So I said, well, good chance that that might be the problem. Now, I don't have a solar sucking station, solar sucking pump, those type of hand pumps that you see people using online, they are garbage, they just don't work. Don't use it, you will ruin the PCB. What you need is a, a real mechanical pump with an actual motor, the soldering station, where you click on a button and it uh, sucks the solar. That's a great tool that I don't have. 
You could also use a hot air station, but on an old board like this, 30 years old or 35 years old, I would advise you not to use anything hot air related, only if strictly necessary. So how did I get this off? As you can see, as you can see, there's a lot of flux, but there is absolutely no damage to the to the board or to the traces. So I might show you this on a video, but what I do is I get some painter's tape, paper tape, and wrap the whole board with paper tape. Just leave the two ICs unwrapped. Okay, so I put tape all around the board. Then I flip the board around. I add some flux and fresh solder into each pin. I use a 100 watt soldering iron, believe it or not, because uh, I usually work on vacuum tube equipment. So I have a 60 watt soldering iron and a 100 watt one. I don't have any SMD type of tools. It's not what I usually do working on these boards. So 100 watt iron, touch a pin, and then with an air compressor, I just blow blow air next to the pin and it's very clean very easy very fast you touch a pin and pff, blow air touch another pin and pff, blow air in a, in a matter of 30 seconds the, the ic falls out okay now it will it will be like this full of solder but this solder is not really stuck to the to it so with a sharp screwdriver or something you can easily clean that solder off and i did the same on this board as you can see, let me show you here. So, as you can see, it's not that bad. Okay, looks really clean. Now there is a capacitor here that I desoldered to. It's not perfectly aligned or anything, but yeah, it works. The board is, it was not overheated. There's no damage to adjacent components. It works. All you need is an air compressor. You might say, oh, but an air compressor is an expensive tool. Yes, but it's a tool that you can use for anything. And if you buy a, sol a desoldering station just to fix one board, I mean, yeah. If you already have it, cool. I'm planning to buy one, but for now, I have an air compressor, and that's what I use. It works just fine. I might show you that on a video if you're interested. It's really easy. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug the hard drive and we'll see how it works if it still works it was it was fixed yesterday it worked let's see if it still works today all right the drive is plugged and i'm going to power it up and you're going to see what happens okay this is the sequence it should stop right about there. It's working. Now what I do when I have a drive like this that has been sitting around for a lot of time is you want to exercise the hell out of it. Just use Spinrite or any other hard drive testing tool uh, or run some benchmarks on it, whatever. You want, you want to give it a, a beating because you want the you want to grease the old grease on the bearings and and on the stepper to kind of get soft again. I added some drops of oil on this bearing right here because the shaft is exposed, but all the other ones you can't really do anything. So uh, yeah, I also added just a tiny, tiny little drop of oil onto the guide rail of the head assembly, but you need to be very cautious when you do that because if you put too much oil, it might drip. And if it goes into the platters, then the drive is dead. Okay. Now, uh, you 
after it's working, you really should give it a rough treatment. You should exercise it and work it so that it doesn't get stuck again, at least doesn't get stuck right the, next, the day after. You want it to, to be able to sit a couple of months without getting stuck. Now, another thing you must pay attention on these systems is that, like I said, this is not IDE, this is IDE XT. And when you have an IDE XT system, let's say I want to replace this drive. If this drive goes bad, I want to replace it. Now I can get another IDE XT drive. I cannot plug here an IDE drive, it won't work. Put in a new IDE XT compatible drive, the drive also won't work. So it needs to be initialized by this system, okay? What I believe happens, I'm not sure, there's not a lot of information, but what I think it happens is that this computer doesn't have a BIOS setup, so you cannot configure the hard drive type. So what the system does is that it writes the number of heads, cylinders, and all that information into a specific location on the drive. It knows where it kept that information. So when you power the computer up, it grabs that information from the drive and then it knows how to handle the drive, okay? Now if you just pick up a random Seagate ST351, I think, or other IDEXT compatible drive and plug it in here, chances are it won't work right off the bat. You need to initialize it, okay? This computer came with a specific initialization utility. I don't know if you need to use the specific version for this, for the computer you're working with, or if you can use a generic one. I've never explored those situations, but yeah, you can't just plug in a random drive and expect it to work, even if the hard drive is perfectly fine. 